Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hit and Hustle from irishsportsdaily.com. I'm your host, Greg Vermont. We've got another fun interview for you today. Former Notre Dame football player Derek Mays, uh, someone that I followed growing up, someone who was kind of instrumental in me uh, becoming a Notre Dame fan and following Notre Dame. And uh, very exciting moments. Uh, a lot of people's favorite player. Uh, his was the first jersey I ever had, the, the number one jersey, um, which feels different in the NIL era we're in now. But um, we're going to talk to him about that. We're going to talk to him about his time at Notre Dame and uh, what he's doing now. His son is a is a is a high school basketball player out in Southern California, a uh, very highly recruited uh, basketball player. So we're going to talk to him about raising a, 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 a high school athlete and just going into college and what that's like and uh, how he's feeling about the Notre Dame football program and what he's been doing since he left university. So uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning into that um, or tuning into this. If you like what you hear, uh, please subscribe to this channel. Please hit the notification bell. Please like this video. Uh, it really helps us out. And uh, before we get going with Derek, I want to talk to you about a couple of our sponsors, the first of which is ESQ Clothing, which is founded by Notre Dame alum, Ga Wei. You've seen ESQs uh, on all of your favorite Notre Dame players and coaches. With over a decade of making the best custom clothing available, ESQ will help you look and feel your best in 2024. From the perfect fitting suit or sport coat, shirt or bomber jacket, or that perfect tuxedo for wedding season, check out Gaz's amazing work at esqclothing.com and book an appointment to upgrade your wardrobe today. Mention ISD and get 10% off your entire purchase. And I want to thank our second sponsor, on this show that sponsors all of our shows, and that is VSRMediaCompany.com, which is founded by Notre Dame football pregame host and Emmy Award-winning anchor Vahid Sabuzadeh. VSR Media provides professional and cinematic video and photo. Whether you're looking for a collegiate or pro-level highlight reel, have a personal story to tell, or are aiming to diversify and grow your business, VSR Media specializes in short and long-form video storytelling, social media management, and website design. We've, VSR Media captures professional headshots, senior, and sports photos. Contact them at vsrmediacompany.com. Mention Irish Sports Daily to receive 20% off your first project. Visit them online or give them a call at 574-800-9106. All right, let's get to our conversation with Derek Mays. All right, Derek, it's January 1st, 1994. You guys are in the locker room. Just beat Texas A&M in the Cotton Bowl, 24-21. You're 11-1. and And what does Lou Holtz tell the team? How are you feeling when you go to bed that night? Do you feel like you're going to wake up national champion? Oh, my. Um, so it didn't quite go like that. Um, it went more like we beat Texas A&M. We go back to the team hotel where we had the same celebration a year before my freshman year after being yeah, Texas a yeah. So deja vu all over again. Only difference, um, Greg, was this time we were all hanging out in the lobby at the party and we were waiting to find out the results of the maybe Orange Bowl at Florida yeah. State, Nebraska. Yeah. They win. We assume that at the very least, it's going to be a um, split national championship. Uh, I think they interview Bobby Bout, and Bobby goes and says what he says. I can't remember, and I'm not even going to try to paraphrase. Mm. But I remember all of us down there, coach included. I mean, we were all down there, and yeah. you know, it might have been eleven o'clock. You know, probably Central Time, midnight, East Coast time. And um, whatever he said, it just sucked the wind out of all of us. We were like, oh, we're doomed. Because by that argument, you know, uh, we knew that the popular vote was not in our favor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew that just because we knew who we were being at Notre yeah. Dame. So going into the game, knowing that everything was up in the air over who would win the national championship, and we also knew – that it wasn't going to come down to the wins and loss. We knew we were going to beat a and We knew Florida State was going to beat Nebraska. But what we didn't know was what human element was going to be uh, um, the deciding factor, those voters. Um, and so we really went to bed dejected already. We knew the writing mm -hmm. on the wall. Um, 
And so sure enough, the next morning, I think we wake up and we hear that, you know, we got one vote out of three. So technically the consensus uh, national yeah. champ was Florida State. And, uh, you know, we, we just kicked ourselves uh, all over again for that D.C. loss because, you know, that was the thing that we could control and we just didn't. And it wasn't because we weren't the better team. We were the best team in that entire decade that year. Yeah. And so you guys, so the BC loss for you, it's, it's probably difficult because, you know, it, to that point, you know, it was probably your best game, right? You, you, you had played a bunch of catches. Uh, your, your team fell down, obviously 38 to 17 Flur, uh, flurry uh, up on offense in the fourth quarter. You yourself, you made a, a, a number of huge catches specifically the, the one to, to the bomb, the, the, the post route where you're turning back. At the time, I would say I was 13 years old. I, I thought this is the best catch I've ever seen, just the way well, you turn in your body. I hope you're laying that under the podcast as we speak, so good. Oh, <laughs> I, if, if, if the copyright – so the copywriters, they'll, they'll come get you on that stuff. Uh, but it's it's a tremendous catch. I posted it on Twitter uh, a couple years ago during COVID, actually, when we were all watching old games. But um, made a tremendous catch there. Go up 39-38 for you. It was kind of – not – you had a good season already, right? Like that, you were already having like a really good year coming off your freshman year, where your first three catches were touchdowns, and twenty four catches for five hundred yards as as a sophomore on the ninety three team. That game in particular, you you were on fire. You come out with a loss. Is, is that? It just is, do you think at all about the way that you played in that game, or is just the outcome and just how unfortunate it was that you guys didn't? Sure, you know that I think about it. Yes, um, not real time uh I'll, I'll say um sure it was the best uh performance of my college career at the time mm -hmm. um i i felt like i'm i I'm, i i should have been there anyhow i meant to be there i i knew that um but i think in true context you know that week before uh <laughs> uh he's only done this twice um the week before the uh, the Florida State game that we won, the game of the century, we beat Florida mm -hmm. State at home. Coach Holtz told all the wide receivers, leave those gloves in your locker room because your asses won't need them. All you wide outs, you're going to be blocking. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. If you remember, Ray Zellers and Lee Beckton tore it up. Yes. They, killed, they killed Florida State. And we blocked our asses off. I mean, we, Lake Dawson, myself, Clint Johnson. I mean, we, we were, uh, Adrian Jarrell, I believe. We were all mm -hmm. through there, right? Um and the only other time he did that was my freshman year when we played at USC. Um, and he told us the same thing in Reggie Brooks and uh, Jerome Bettis tore it up for like 150 a piece. It was nuts. Yeah. Um, so I guess the real thing was it was in contrast to that week prior to. Now, all that comes back to and, and centers around um, who I think is – the most uh, underappreciated, undervalued, and uh, just overlooked quarterback in Notre Dame history, and that's Kevin McDougal. Um, Kevin McDougal was the best basketball player out there on that field, and that included Charlie Ward. Wow. Kevin McDougal was a scratch golfer and probably the only scratch golfer on that field. Wow. Um, Kevin McDougal was the best quarterback in that game. Kevin McDougal was the best passer that I ever had at Notre Dame. So unfortunate and, and borderline criminal that Kevin had to take that game on his shoulders in Boston College. Mm -hmm. um, that whole fourth quarter, Kevin threw the playbook out. Whatever play came in, he said to F it. This is wow. what we're going to do instead. Um, the only play <laughs> that we ran that was called for us was after all those that that those two drives that we that we were working in the end in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, I kept coming across the middle, kept coming yep. out. Yep. Those are all Kevin. Those, Kevin was calling those. D, I want you to do this. And um, Coach Holtz called a play. I've, he's never drawn anything up in the dirt before. He said, called a timeout. He said, Kevin, I want you to do that same play. But this time he said, Derek, I want you to 
go in a little bit and I want you to take off. And that was the past that you're referring to. Yeah. Um, why do I say all that? Because in the middle of um, the, 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 the most important game of all of our careers, coaches, Coach Holtz is included. That's what he turned to. He turned to Kevin McDougal and this sophomore, Derek Mays, um, to go make a play. And what the, I, again, the crime is that Kevin McDougal, that was his last regular season game yeah. of his career. And he did not get to show that he had that all along. Mm. Um, so it was bittersweet in that respect, too. You know, when I when I, and obviously when I get older, I'm able to have a little bit more uh, distance to really understand it and have a different perspective. But even then, I I, I felt that then, and it was tough. It really made the uh, the Cotton Bowl tougher because it didn't matter what we were going to do there. We knew we were going to beat them. We knew, but we knew through that Boston College loss, you know, we 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 tricked off the one thing that we could control. Yeah, yeah. Uh I wonder if so. That I mean, you said you deserve. You knew you would be there the whole time. Yeah. Um, and then you went on to set the Notre Dame record for touchdowns in a season in 1994, um, and then in 1990, 1995, um, you know, 48 catches, 881 yards, set a number of career touchdown catches at the University of Notre Dame. My my number one thing, like when I think about Derek Mays, is like how confident you were, like you were so confident out there and you like, and not just that, but there was like a certain amount of joy that you played with. Like, cause uh, you know, you, you went head to head against like some of the best college corners uh, of the era. Right. And uh, I kind of sent this to you in kind of the outline, like, uh, like Chris Hudson, 1994 in that Fiesta Bowl, he, he won the, he won the Thorpe award. Right. And you, you gave him over a hundred yards. Uh, Samari Roll, uh, one, one of my favorite games, which which you're an a Orange Bowl Hall of Famer because of this, of what you did in that game. Like, you had those guys, like, turned around. I'll never forget Sean Hammond. You tipped the ball to yourself, and Sean Hammond just throws a tantrum in, in, in the end zone because you just can't believe that he let you. And you're laughing. Like, you're you're laughing about it. Like, you're smiling. And and you, I, you know, respectfully, like, you were always, you were always chirping. You you know you were always talking to guys, and it was like in an almost like uh, like playful way, not playful, but like not not uh, well, right. not malicious. No, just no, you're absolutely know. right. Just yeah. genuine uh, competition, and yeah. and what I think um, when I hear you know that's just so great too. When I hear and I see you know Coach Prime and getting all this pub and 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 I see Mike Irvin. Um, you know, uh, on undisputed now, like those are the guys I came up watching and and yeah, yeah, yeah. and wanting to emulate. So for me, you know, that was just part of it, man. Go out and have fun, and let's see who's the best. That's it, and we'll yeah. find out, and and it'll be fun. Um, and and so you know, having those kind of guys as my you know big brothers and and uncles to be able to to see what it's like to compete, right? And then to be able to go to Notre Dame where that's all we did. So I promise you, if you thought I was a talker, go take a look at Lake Dawson at practice. Go take a Lake Dawson who used to take his helmet off after every touchdown. That's what I yeah. saw as a freshman, right? Uh, Jerome Bettis, he goes in the end zone. He's taking that helmet off. And, like, we loved to compete. So I wasn't doing anything different than what all my, my old brothers were, were showing me that – had the 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 metrics right had the merit to boot mm. and and i i appreciate what you said there greg because i really do believe man you know it's not talking trash if we're out there giving our all and yeah. happy for whatever the outcome is going to be right somebody's going to win somebody's going to lose and by the way nobody's ever not going to win i mean not going to lose right so you know what are we going to do while we're out here Right. And and uh, I think sometimes uh, uh, that may have come off um, as brash or um, but it wasn't because that's how our practices were. We went at it. And that's why I know it was the best team of the decade, because you look at all the guys who went into the league out of that night yeah. uh, from that team. 
right? Mm -hmm. Now that team was stocked with by far, in my opinion, the best class that has ever played in modern Notre Dame football history. I mean, Bryant Young, Jeff Burris, Lake Dawson, we got Hall of Famers in that class, Aaron Taylor. Oh my goodness. I mean, Bobby the Taylor. list goes on and on. We had backups, Willie Clark going the fourth round because he ran a four two at the time. I mean, it was amazing how much talent was on that team. Yeah. Pete Bursich, oh my God, Brian Flanagan, I can go, Jim Flanagan, I can go on and on and on. Um so yeah, that that be, because of that and seeing it every day in practice, um, that's why we had so much fun out there because we were just happy to go and take it out on somebody else, you know, uh, after six days of taking it out on each other. Yeah, and it was an era too for wide receivers specifically where you guys were an I formation team, so no one's hiding Derek Mays, right? No one is. Uh, there you get you guys aren't like scheming Derek Mays to get oh, matched say up that on word. A, you said the word. People get upset these days when I try to point out the difference between a scheme offensive attack that gets wide outs open and the stuff that I had to watch Mike right. Irvin and Jerry and and Robert Brooks and Andre Rise and do. I mean, there's yeah. a big difference. Yeah, like you're out there, it, you're in man. We're we're playing man against Sean Springs. We're playing man against Bryant Westbrook. And go win, right? And so, like, that's that, – that, that, to me, it's like when people, uh, you know, talk about – like, you know, any time in the offseason, talk about, like, uh, you know, who Don't the best Don't make any names. Is. I know what you mean. Well, no, I'm not but, getting thrown under the bus. People who have – people who have legitimately done things. But, yes. like, it's like don't don't forget Derek Mays because it's a different era. Like, I – I looked at the the tar like the the number of catches versus the number of passes, right? Yes. And it's like you guys are throwing the ball two hundred times a year. Right? Can Can you please show me where those stats were? I've never been able to find them. I'm not an analytics guy, but I look up, in my head a yeah. lot about that rate, whatever that clip was, because I yeah. know I was extremely efficient, and I know Coach only threw the ball maybe fourteen times. I'm, I knew that average yeah. Um, yeah. for the longest. That was the one average that I did understand um versus what the average is today um yeah. i'll also just say one more thing and i had a great conversation with the new athletic director at notre dame uh people uh -huh. at uh, one of the games this past year and we got to talking about just nuances of everything and one of the things that he had you know mentioned we started talking about stats and i said well before you go anywhere i'm just going to tell you i'm i'm a bit jaded i said not for me and i, I pointed to Ron Pollis is an associate athletic director there. I said, not to me, but for my quarterback. I said, you know, my quarterback has two bowl games um, where he threw at least two touchdown passes to me and over 180 yards. And guess what? Those stats don't count for him in the in the record books. Oh, yeah. That's and right. Of course, Pete said, yeah. well, man, that's that does stink for uh, for Ron. Um, I guess it probably stinks for you, too. I said, well, listen, you know, there's a whole lot of folks that uh, have leapfrogged me in the all time. Uh, category and I'm gracious and knowing that um, you know times change but you know when they make those kind of decisions and allow post game stats to come in um, it makes it more appealing the game uh, there's a good reason why they're you know there's passing more now than than before um, so I'm not mad at it I feel like pound for pound there's a there's a place for me in in a respectful world you just, I'm just saying, people don't sleep on it. The Derek Mays was was giving it to him uh, in in the mid in mid nineties. There, um, you talked about the competitiveness, right? And so, coming up, went to grew up in Indianapolis. You went to North Central High School there. Um, did, did I have it right? I, I think I. It's funny. I no, know my both. Mom was, so my mom, yeah, my, my dad was um, my dad was an entrepreneur. He um, okay. ran a screen printing and engraving company back in Indianapolis for, for decades. Um, and my mom was a principal. So she was. Okay. Um, Your mom was a principal. OK. Yeah. At, at, at Christmas Attic, uh, Christmas Attics um, High School. Uh, it was the first integrated high school back in Indiana. Not when she was obviously the principal, right. but yeah. uh, home of Oscar Robinson and ton of a uh, ton of uh, history behind it. But um, yeah, you know, she was an admin, uh, national administrator of the year. Um, so I grew up in a, you know, well-educated background. Mom and dad both went to, they were college sweethearts, uh, McDonough and Lane, Lane College, uh, HBCU in uh, Jackson, Tennessee, my dad's hometown. Um, they made their way up to Indy uh, right after the Vietnam War. My dad got drafted and uh, 
he uh, sent my mom up there to 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 stay safe until she got back. <clears throat> and uh, so yeah, I grew up there. I'm a pride uh, pride of Indiana. I promise you, if I was just oh, two inches taller, I'd be playing basketball. I, uh, I wanted to be, ask you that. If I, I'd be, I had or, a yeah, I'd be uh, playing, but... yeah, I'd be I'd, I'd certainly be um, trying my best. That was uh, the thing growing up in Indianapolis. I love seeing the All Star Game. Um, this year uh, in Indy, it was uh, it was just great memories, and uh, a lot of those folks are family to me, um, literally family to me, um, yeah. including the late great Hall of Famer Roger Brown, who happens to be my father-in-law. Uh, so when people look at my son, who's the current uh, high school recruit class of 2025, playing basketball, they all say, "Man, you get he's got some awesome genes." I said, "Well, listen, my genes are bonus, right? He's got." <laughs> He's got the uh, Hall of Fame blood in him that uh, I can't take uh, credit for. But, um, yeah, you know, that was it was a great upbringing. Um, um, I, I really enjoyed my my childhood back there. It was uh, sort of the three sport era where you got to do everything. So I played yes. basketball, played football, ran track. Uh, funny you. story. I had a funny um, because of recruiting. You want to see how crazy this world is. Uh, fast forward to where we are now. I'm a you know high school high school basketball dad. My son's being recruited. He's uh, out visiting Butler, where Thad Mod is the head coach. And Thad tells this great story. He goes, uh, Hudson, I I knew your dad back when he was in high school. And I, you know, here we go. I don't I don't know where he's going with this, but at the time, Thad was uh, he graduated from Butler. He was finishing up, uh, I think, grad work here as a grad student at Butler on uh, for the basketball team. And he would go and student teach at North Central in high school. Okay. So, so he tells us, and he's like, yeah, he was, it was during the track season. One day I was out there at, after school and the kids were running track and yeah, I, I didn't really, I, I knew about this kid who played football, Derek Mays, but he was over there playing catch with some kids or something. And I, he goes, all of a sudden the ball goes over the fence. He goes, and to this day, it's the most athletic thing I've ever seen in my life. This kid just jumps over the fence. He doesn't grab it with his hands. He literally puts his foot on the top of the fence and just hops over, grabs the ball, and does the same thing house back. I said, oh, my God. He goes, so, Hudson, if you got any (laughs) of those type of athletic abilities, I promise you we're going to keep a strong eye on you. So, you know, that was growing up in Indy. It really was. It was a a great time to be there. Um, um, Competition, you know, was always uh, the thing. Everyone – just wanted to compete for the fun of it. Um, and I think this well-rounded um, high school career. Was it going to always be Notre Dame for you? What was the recruiting process like? So, um, no. Um, I, I like you, um, became a Notre Dame fan because of Rocket. Okay. And I, I tell Rocket that uh, every time I see him. Um, uh, and that was probably around my junior year, I think it was. 1990, when he ran that kickback against Colorado and called it back. Oh, I mean, gut rich. And then that reminded me so much about the, you know, fast forward six years later, my uh, my uh, Orange Bowl uh, kick got called. Yes, back. you did. Yes, you did. To put, put us back on Same top stadium. There. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was my best. That was my that was my best uh, Rocket Ishmael uh, uh, impersonation. I was feeling. Yes. I felt like Rocket from the day. I, I mean, from the moment I went out there on the field, and I I, I did my best to emulate him. Um, but um, yeah, I, I was a big fan of, uh, of of Big Ten football, but I was a huge fan of uh, of uh, the Hurricanes. Uh, oh, okay. And um, so my top five uh, teams that it came down to: uh, Notre Dame, Michigan, uh, Ohio State, Penn State, and University of Miami. Uh, now, as you mentioned earlier, my mom was a principal for 30 something years, national administrator of the year. Um, there was no way she was letting me go to University of Miami. In fact, she said, Derek, you go ahead, go down there, take dad, take your brother, take your big brother. You guys have a great time because I know you're not going there anyway. And you're not making any commitments or anything until you get back here. Um, so that's what we did. And um, I get down there and Dennis Erickson's the head coach. Um, and, you know, this is literally in the middle of what now has become um, Catholics versus convicts time. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I get to meet Erickson and uh, they put me up with two hosts. I had two hosts down there. Uh, my day host was Gino Toretta. And Gino had just come off winning the Heisman. I think they had just come off winning the national championship. 
And yes. uh, that was my day host. And so he uh, he took me down to Penrods, uh, which is now called Nikki Beach, I believe. And back then, you know, it was way more topless than it is now. And he said, hey, Mr. Mays, you want to come with me? I'm going to take a Derek on a walk on the beach. My brother, uh, uh, he slept in that night from the night before, so he was nowhere to be found. Um, and my dad says, nope, you guys go. He, I think he already sensed what was happening. So Gino takes me on a walk on the beach and everybody's, hey, Gino, hey, Gino. It was amazing. Um, so that was my day host. Uh, we had a great lunch down there. And then he uh, takes me back, you know, it's about six o'clock now. He goes, no, um, I'm gonna turn you over to my brother. You're gonna take good care of you. Uh, I said, what are you talking about, Gino? He's like, well, this is your evening host. I said, okay. And he drops me off at this condo on the couch is a red shirt freshman warren sap um come out the back room it is lamar thomas and uh his roommate was i think kevin williams at the time and okay. so lamar was my host for the night time and um back then uh, uncle luke was live and in person uh i remember we had courtside seats at the heat game with me lamar and uncle luke uh, and then the two of them take me to Uncle Luke's club. <laughs> By the way, Bobby Taylor was on this same visit. And so Bobby and I, we hit it off because we both had already made commitments to Notre Dame. And so we confirmed right before the, the, the entire weekend started. It was like, so just so I'm clear, are you, you're definitely going to Notre Dame, right? Bobby said, yeah. I said, okay, great. Me too. We're officially brothers. We're officially best friends. <laughs> and let's go enjoy this um, trip. So the trip ensued. And um, I think the rest was history. The rest is history. That's, that's, that's awesome. I, 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 it's interesting. Like, I understand, because uh, as a parent, right? So I have three kids. Uh, the oldest is nine. Um, as a parent, I, I completely understand that sentiment, right? And I'm sure you do now, too. Like, I, you, you would do anything. Like, you, you will choose a career. You will choose where you live. Like, you will do all these things to get your children into the best uh, educational situation you can, right? Uh, and so I, I totally I totally understand that. Um, had I, had, talk, had I, had I went to Miami, though, I would have set that town on fire. If you <laughs> thought Lamar Thomas was something, he would have groomed just an amazing 2.0 version of himself. I would have been an awesome wide out. There's no, I'm sure half of my life expectancy would have been cut in half, but um, you know, that would have been the price I paid for it. Yes. Uh, it does seem like though, just from reading about you and like other interviews you've done over the years, it, you were kind of destined for a school like Notre Dame because it seems like you always had that, um, your kind of mind, you know, thinking about things other than football. And I, I was I was reading something you you uh, you did with the Observer, I think it was in 2014. You were talking about how Lou uh, Lou Holtz, and I've never I've never heard this before. I'm, I'm wondering if you could expand on it. Yeah, was talking about how your football life in your athletic life really is like basically a hiatus. Oh yeah, from yeah. your um, quote, from yeah. like your, your I don't know like I don't want to say real life or whatever, but explain what you mean by that. Explain. No, what you it mean is real life. Your, you know, they're, okay. they, they're both real life, yeah. um, but they're two separate parallel lives, meaning, and what he meant behind it was, yeah, you're taking a hiatus from your, your, your life, you know, as, as, as we understand it in the, in the familiar terms, while you're pursuing this unicorn life, in this crazy other dimension that is professional sports and at some point you got to come out of that matrix yeah. <laughs> and back into the the world so you know up here we, we get to be you know neo and yeah. and prime time and amazing and you know the bus and but when you when you're done you know you got to come back down here and you're you're, you're mr Ant, you're john anderson Right. Yeah. yeah. You're Derek yeah. Mays. Um, and so, you know, yeah, that resonated with me even during the recruiting process. Um, you know, he said, I'm not here just for four years. I'm here for the next 40 years of your life. And my mom said, great, you can take him back up to South Bend with you now. Um, it was it was one of those kind of just simple yeah. uh, understandings, uh, not transactional, but certainly I knew um, 
I knew what I was getting out of this on the front end. And my, my family knew. Um, I, I had been around football all my life. Um, when I go back, going back to Indianapolis growing up there, one of the things, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about sort of the the, the catalyst of all this. Um, in the seventh grade, I'm sorry, my mom was pregnant with me when she was teaching before she became a principal. Okay. And um, she had a seventh grader <laughs> who, for all practical purposes, probably had ADD and wasn't, you know, it wasn't even able to, to, to diagnose it back then. Right. Uh, very rambunctious, amazing kid by the name of Mark Clayton. Okay. Mark Clayton, who went on to become a record set and wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins with Dan Marino, mm -hmm. um, at the time took up an offering throughout all the kids at class for my first baby blanket when she was pregnant with me. Wow. He's been around our, our family ever since. And um, he told my mom last year, because he's a finalist for the Hall of Fame, he said, Mrs. Mays, if I get the call, I want you to introduce me. Um, so that's how close they are. And that's how close we all are. Um, so from those days of me growing up, I had my superhero in Mark Clayton. I knew what it was like to be a professional wideout because I saw it firsthand. Um, you know, it, it bleeds into sort of my professional thesis. And I think that is um, there's two things you need in life, and that's access and advocacy. Um, I had access to 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 something that I was so passionate about from the day I was born. Um, mm -hmm. I had an amazing access to an amazing individual like Mark. Um, and then I had advocacy, right, from my parents um, and that little village that was built around me. Um, so, yeah, a lot of this stuff was, um, you know, somewhat pre, you know, predisposed. Um, and and um, um, I don't know where I was going with that tangent, but I felt like I needed to make sure I put that part yeah. in about Mark because it really does transcend the rest of my, you know, uh, career. And uh, that was, it was just all rooted in me. Well, I'm glad you brought it up because I'm always curious about like everyone's kind of journey, right? Like no one is just, no one knows where everything's headed, right? right. And so like where, like for, for you, like you, you said you were a basketball player and then you could have, and then you became a football player, you know, and then you became a great football player, a recruited football player. You ended up at Notre Dame, uh, second round, not just at Notre Dame, record setting wide receiver at Notre Dame. Um, you know, not to, not to be like embarrassing, whatever you're, you're a lot of people's favorite player at Notre Dame, right? Like a, like a legend, right? So that's, um, you know, it's notable, right? Um, and I, and I wonder, A, A, I wonder two things, and I'm talking about, uh, your son Hudson now. Yes. A, does he, does he know how good you, you were, I guess? Does he know this? Does he? Does he give you a hard time about it? Like, does he do the thing where it's like, I don't know, like, uh, sure. Like, like, you know, does he kind of like, sure, you, I'm sure you were great. Here's what I'll say. I, I believe, I believe, and I I, uh, I just sent you a couple of um, items around Hetty uh, okay. to give some more color. Um, I believe Hudson, um, you know, has uh, an appreciation for what I did. But I believe he understands, like I do now, um, that you know I we really do believe this to our heart, heart of hearts. Um, that a lot of that was for 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 me to be able to give to him insight, very much like I was able to gain insight from the you know Mark Clayton's of the world at a very early age. Mm. So the access that's I, I believe he uh, um, values that. A whole lot. Yeah. So I, I believe he values that much more than any of the, you know, sort of stuff that came with it. Now, that being said, yeah, he's, you know, he's seen enough clips of mine to know um, what I could do. Um, but he's also had experiences with other friends and, you know, old teammates of mine um, that, that, you know, he gets around and, um, they'll tell him and, and, you know, folks like rocket rocket to be over here, yeah. you know, his mother, his wife's uh, from here in LA and he comes out and watch, you know, Huddy's baseball games when they were, when, when he was in middle school and we'll go out to lunch afterwards. And he's like, do you, you just don't know about your dad, those kind of things. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, access and advocacy, you know, I've always believed that the stuff that we tell our kids, you know, they need to hear it from somebody else. 
Right. Um, yeah. and, and very much the same, it worked for me, you know, having that access and advocate and someone like Mark, um, just to be able to hear it differently, hear it from someone else. It goes a long way. And so um, I believe in putting mentors around, you know, my son the same way uh, to give him those those access points. Um, was it was it hard for you, um, like kind of initially when he was, let's say, seven, eight years old? to like was he was he always i guess what did you feel like he was always showed the predilection to be like a great athlete or what, like were you not sure initially or what no, was from it day one. Right away? from day okay. one from day one i knew um i knew what i had on my hands from day one um he was just an early developer he was early developing at everything um mm -hmm. um he was you know a a June baby. So we actually started in school the year before versus waiting a year after because he was so accelerated. Um, literally rode a, started riding his bike at three. Um, wow. No training wheels. I mean, I just literally threw him on a miniature bike. I did it in the grass and I pushed him and he never stopped riding. Um, just picked up stuff so quickly. Um, so that was my first inclination. Now, because of that and because of my own experience and because of what I understood when it comes to historical data, um, I felt like he was going to have the body type of his grandpa and he was going to be taller than me. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as I like football and as much as I enjoyed it, it's not for everyone. And I believe there's um, there's two things that come with football, temperament and development. Um, and without those two mints, you, 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 you're not going to be able to, to excel in football. Um, it's such a developmental sport. A lot of people don't know what they have until they go through puberty. So my theory was, well, just save your brain and a whole lot of miles and not play tackle football until you get into high school. So that's what I told him. I, he said, dad, I want to play football like you. And I was like, sure, kid. I'll tell you what, when you get into high school, if you still want to play football right in, all, all yours, you get, you got the green light. Um, meanwhile, you know, he grew and now he's six foot five and a half and it's a thing of the past. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I did see that I did have sort of the, the foresight to sort of see that. And, um, he has the temperament of his hall of fame grandpa versus my rough and tumble, uh, temperament, um, people, including uh, a lot of, um, the old uh, Pacer Hall of Famers and even Reggie Miller would say when they see Huddy out there playing, it looks just like his grandpa. He's a sort of a reincarnation. So that's really fun because for me, it takes the pressure off of him having to ever replace anything that I ever did. And I know that's yeah. really tough for, for kids. And I, I know a lot of them up here, out here in LA growing up, um, all the babies, the Justin Pippins, the Cam, uh, Cam yeah. Martin, yeah. Uh, Bryce James, they were all classmates or teammates during this period of time. And, and it's, man, that's tough. Huddy got to, you know, do all of that and be adjacent and, and not have that extra element. Um, just because, you know, I was over here in the football and he's now in the basketball. So that's been, I think, um, I think that's been really helpful for his development. I wonder what kind of, uh, I guess, sports dad you are. Are you, uh, you do you, are you like, are you, are you boisterous? Are you yelling? Are you quiet? Are you off to the side? Are you sitting front row? Like, I, I want, I wonder how you take in games. Here's what I'll tell you. <laughs> um, I remember just probably two or three years ago, Huddy was watching a game. He was like, Oh my God, dad, when I get in the league, I'm gonna get you court side tickets. What else do you know? I said, no, you don't. I don't want court side tickets. I said, you go get me a mama's suite. <laughs> nobody needs to see me <laughs> this is all about you yeah. um and it really is um uh you know i <clears throat> i stopped coaching him very early on i went out and found him the the right kind of coach and mentor that i felt that he needed for his development and we've stuck with him this entire time um he's that horse whisperer to him like I said, people got to hear it from different people. And I knew that he'd be speaking the same kind of language. We'd be speaking from the same hymn book. And that's been really successful. I encourage any parent to think about it in those terms versus the wins and losses. I wasn't looking for a wins and loss team. I feel like you're, you're winning if you're developing. Um, and if you're doing it with the right kind of people, you know, the winning will be a byproduct. So because of that, um, 
I sit all the way up at the top. Um, mm. You want to hear a great story about it? Huddy's teammate is um, Harold Miner's son. Okay. And so Harold and I, you'll find us up in the corner, no one, no one near us, and you know, no one has to hear any of our yeah, 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 yeah. Our comments. I, 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 a hundred percent, I know what this is because I. So my daughter is in club soccer now, and uh, I see. The thing is, it's it's very hard for me to um, kind of let go of like. Because, she, like I said, she's only nine, right? So she's not like you know super developed like uh, like your son Hudson is. But it's hard. Like I want her to see what I see, and so I'm always trying to tell her like I want you to go right there because that's where the ball is going to go. And her coach is always telling us like, "Hey, you got to let them figure it out. You got to let them figure it out." And that's easy to say, right? But then you're like in the midst of it, and you're like, I, uh, "Please go there because the ball is going to end up there." I I just know it. Like, please. And so that's very hard. So I, I always like to ask uh, kind of parents, like how they kind of manage that stuff. Because for yeah, me, Don, Don Staley said it best. Uh, I saw a great clip Don Staley said. Um, in fact, she's she's um, she went into the Hall of Fame, same class as my father-in-law, Roger Brown. And oh, okay. uh, uh, she said, you know, I'm here to make them uncomfortable. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they have to fail. Yeah. Um and parents just in general, they don't want to see their kids fail and they don't want them to fail, um, but they have to. Now, I think what she's really pointing to, and it's not this grandiose idea of failure, but it's the micro failures within a within a game, within a play, within a sequence. Within a possession, yeah. Right. Within a possession. And if you get that granular, you can allow your kid to fail. So, you know, one of the things that we are big on is film work because in film, what do they say? The eye in the sky don't lie. I in the sky don't lie. So, you know, things that I see up there up top, you know, I'm seeing, I'm up top for a reason. And, mm -hmm. and, and, um, you know, when you're in the weeds, it's really hard to see from 10,000 feet. So, you know, that's given us a really good opportunity to, Talk about what's 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 real, and we're able to do it in a in a you know place of um, review versus you know critique in the real time. And I don't think that I have. I'm not saying I got the you know got the the cheat code to this thing, but it's been it's been really successful for us. Yeah. Um, as we kind of wrap up here, I, I do want to kind of point out, like speaking of you, kind of being outside of the 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 eye or outside of the spotlight, things of yeah. that nature. Um, over the years, you know, I, I, I think of Derek Mays and, and then you're just kind of like not a public figure within the Notre Dame football program. Right. And then over the last couple of years, I, I've seen you pop up a little bit more, right? Like you, you, you were on a, uh, a trip. I think the, a lot of football players came out to Southern California. I, 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 wanna say, I know they were at the beach, Right. I don't know if, if it was. Sure. I I'll, I'll, I can explain that. Yeah. The, okay, you go know, ahead. So, you know, one of the mantras at Notre Dame, they talk about time, talent and treasure. Okay. Um, you know, those are our three service pillars when, when it comes to our commitment to our university and our lady on the dome. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate that mantra because. You know, sometimes in our lives, we have limited time. Sometimes in our life, we have limited talent because we haven't maybe accrued it yet. Sometimes we have limited treasure. Um, and so, you know, if you look at it linearly, you know, my time at Notre Dame versus the time I left Notre Dame to most recent years where I'm spending, you know, time at Notre Dame, um, there was never a time that I, I left Notre Dame. There were times where I wasn't a part of Notre Dame in its official capacity. And because of that, I was very comfortable um, it not being made public. Um, I think one of those, when I look back, I think about uh, between 2012 and probably 2018, I was at Notre Dame almost weekly during the football season and yeah. monthly during the um, off season. And part of that was because um, I was building up Coach Holtz's uh, foundation, which is now called uh, Holtz's Heroes. At the time it was called Louis Lads. Um, yes. At the time I was um, 
part of an investment uh, group and we went and secured the play like a champion today trademark and um, you know, help move that with uh, coach Holtz. And, and um, so there was a lot of time that I was, you know, in the, in the capacity uh, unofficial capacity of service in the university, but um, you know, it wasn't my, it wasn't my bag to be in the limelight. I actually produced a, a, a TV show um, even before 2012 uh, when I retired back there at Notre Dame's uh, campus. And it was a weekly television show called Irish Rewind. And we, um, I syndicated it throughout 34 markets in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it wasn't me in front of the camera. Um, right. It was me behind the camera. So yeah, I, I've never left the university. It's only most recent. I've been on the board for the Monogram uh, Club the last uh, four years. So that brings me back now. Um, in a more official capacity over the last yeah. four years. And therefore when I'm there, I, you know, I don't, I don't go looking for interviews, but I certainly um, will, 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 um, you know, entertain uh, interview requests while I'm there. Um, so yeah, you've probably heard me more just because of the, of, of my, my activity and in, in, in a more official capacity at Indy, but it's always been there and in my heart. Um, and, and like you said, I'm, more than not reluctant um, to 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 be on the front of the camera versus in, uh, behind it. Yeah, um, I, I want to get your views on the uh, on the on the kind of the current team and the current situation uh, before we get going. But I did want there was something I wanted to point out that I always yes. thought was really cool. Uh, in two thousand six, Jeff Samarja breaks your uh, your record for uh, receiving touchdowns at the University of Notre Dame, and you came back for that. I did. And you were on the sideline and they showed you on television and you were just as happy as can be. And and I, I always thought that was just very cool of you to do because it, it's just one of those things like as a Notre Dame fan, like I think as an outsider, like, oh, Derek Mays, he didn't he didn't have to do that. Right? And, and but as a Notre Dame fan, like I really appreciated it because I felt like you you did it. So, like, we you kind of touched on it earlier. Like, you did it in a time where Notre Dame never threw the ball. And then, and then, uh, and and then Charlie Weiss comes and they're throwing it all the time, right? And so your record, like, a ton of records went down at this point, right? But it was like never. It's just like you were just happy as can be. You gave them the thumbs up when it happened. And I just thought I thought that was the coolest thing. Or something that you did. You came back. You're not like, again, especially talking to you now. Not a public facing uh, figure. And you came back and did that. So I thought that was really cool of you. Um, well, I appreciate it. There's two data points of that I can I'll share with okay. you. Okay. Um, number one, um, Notre Dame didn't fly me back for that. Um, so this wasn't some, this wasn't even their, this wasn't their idea. They had no idea right. I was coming back. Um, this wasn't some kind of publicity stunt. Um, no one knew that I was going to be back there, in fact, until I showed up. Uh, I think Jeff knew I was going to be there. And I remember that night before walking over with the team to the pep rally <laughs> and uh you know i was uh, i was giving jeff a bunch of junk uh, if you remember on that team also was raymond mcknight yes and and raymond was a, he was my little brother and i had gotten to know raymond quite a bit um and and jeff but uh i remember teasing jeff i said look man whatever you do tomorrow i said you know let's celebrate it I said, but make no mistake about it. What you do after this season, if you don't go pick up a bat, I'm going to go take one and hit you upside the head with it <laughs> because that's your future. And uh, so we always get a kick out of that whenever we run into each other. He's like, you told me right, big bro. You you know, you, you, <laughs> sage wisdom. Um, yes. But yeah, um, so those those two pieces, you know, it, it, was, um, it was important to me. Listen, when I broke my record, um, when, when I broke my record, when I became the all-time leading receiver, um, I learned that it was Tom Gatewood. Uh, I did my homework. I learned that Tom Gatewood was the first black Notre Dame captain. Um, people don't realize that part of the reason why I came back my senior year is because I wanted to be a captain. So we're back to that again. Now you think about the Mark Clayton's and the Lake Dawson's. I continued to pick out these mentors along the way. And, and, and I learned about time and I learned about his history. 
And it was the best thing ever to go meet him finally, um, like a two, couple years later. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I felt it was only right, you know, to, to you know, pass it, pass on that, that legacy, that, you know, that, that tradition. And, and, you know, we're truly bonded by our university and it, it, um, it sort of transcends uh, generation and transcends uh, uh, trends and everything else that's uh, been set in the past. And in a kind of a full circle moment as well, when you broke the record, uh, your, there was, your parents were on screen a ton uh, and your mom, she, she had gotten the ball and she was just sitting there holding the ball. And it, it, especially now, like it just, that's awesome. Like that, it's just, it's awesome that that happened. So uh, it, it was very cool to see. Kind Thank of you. All that, so, hey, all that quick, I can like, give you a quick data point on that too. Do it. Um, you know, I was a film TV major at Notre Dame and um, um we would have uh, we would have production meetings. NBC obviously did our our, our games, and we yes. had that exclusive deal with NBC on primetime every Saturday home games. When they would come home and play those home games, uh, John Dockery, uh, oh man, who was uh, color, the the uh, play caller and color commentator? Charlie Jones, Charlie Tyler Jones, Christensen. Yeah. Christensen, all those guys. Um, we they would have a production meeting and you know you know they would want each week to meet with a couple of the players and coach holtz and so it was a thing you know you talk about competition it was a real thing to get called up to go to the production meeting right yeah. and i remember my freshman year i might have got a chance to do it once and the only reason that we all wanted it jeff burris at the time and lake dawson and all the darlings they come back to practice with an nbc hat on or jeff Brown <laughs> bettis I'm like, man, where'd you get? He's like, I met with the producer. So it was a thing that if you get called to go to production meeting because you're going to rock the hat and go back to practice and everybody gets to see it, right? Um, so before I broke that record that Friday, they called me in for the production meeting. Mm -hmm. I was used to it by then. It was my junior year. Um, yeah. And they got to talking and um, might have been Charlie Jones. I can't remember. Pat, no, it wasn't Pat Hayden. It might have been Pat Hayden. Um, they said, okay, Derek, listen, we know you're about to break this record tomorrow. It's likely that you're going to break it. Um, you know, we want to do something special for it. Um, and we don't want you to think too much about it, but we're just giving you a heads up that in each end zone, we're going to have, like, might have been John uh, John Dockery in one end zone, and then uh, is it John Gray? Um, Jim Gray. Jim Gray. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Jim Gray in the other end zone. Um, and whichever end zone you score it in, um, they're going to come out and they're going to grab the ball from you if you don't mind. I said, okay. Um, they said, uh, do you mind if you, if we get the gloves too? I said, okay. I said, I don't know how you guys plan on doing any of this, but sure. If you guys can magically do that, no problem. And like clockwork, game goes on. Uh, I score uh, the the break, breaking touchdown. Here comes John Dockery out on the field. I give him the ball. I give him my gloves. I turn around and start hugging my boys, all my linemen, and we're, you know, chatting it up. They're all telling me congratulations. We're going to sideline. And so this is how much, you know, we knew, like, the business of TV. Going into the kickoff, there was always that guy with the orange mitt. And he'd come out onto the field with his orange oh, yeah. mitt. And that let everybody know we were in commercial break. Cheerleaders, the band's playing, everybody's messing around, the kids in the stands having a great time. But the minute he walks off that field with that mitt, you hear the ref blow the whistle, and we're ready for the next play, whether whatever it happened to be. So in this case, it would be a kickoff. So I'm on defense. I'm sitting – I mean, they're on defense, obviously, coming up after kickoff. I'm on the bench getting some water. There were some cameramen there. I, I knew that. But – I look out and I see the guy with the orange mitt. He's still on the field like this. The ref blows the whistle, but he's still out there holding his mitt. The kids are screaming because they got the guy, uh, the, the kicker out there ready to kick the ball, but nothing is happening. And for like 30 seconds, this is going on. Yeah. I realize when I get home, what you talked about, the interview that they did, they took uh, John Dockery, takes the ball, takes the gloves, runs up into the stands. They find my mom and my dad and they present the ball and the, and the gloves to my mom and my dad and they interview him on the spot. That's when I learned that 
you could take an interstitial from your own commercial program, uh, from your own broadcast programming. They took a 30 second in, in, in yes, a 30 minute, 30 second uh, uh, spot within their commercial time. So they uh -huh. came back out of the commercial. They had 30 seconds left. They're holding the kicker while they do this live interview on TV. And from that point on, I realized that you can pretty much produce anything. <laughs> That's true. It, it was a great moment. Um, last thing, Marcus Freeman, 2024. Uh, just what, what, how do you feel about the program, where it is, and uh, wh where it's kind of headed under Marcus Freeman? What, what, what is your take on that? Um, I like Marcus a lot. I, I got a chance to meet him when he first got the job. Um, he's an amazing individual, family man, um, and he has a vision that is in alignment with um, – what the the great ones at Notre Dame uh, have had, um, the Coach Holtzes of the world, um, the Parsegians, the Rockneys. Um, I feel like he's got a grasp on the climate of college football mm. and the ability to uh, lead young men. That being said, there's a whole lot of other ancillary stuff that come into play um, that make it really tough for any Notre Dame coach to succeed under the current confines. Now, with the new expansion of the playoffs, it sounds like, and I'm sure we're getting a, a lot of heat because everyone says, oh, well, great. Now they're always going to be in the playoffs. Yeah, because we should, um, because we're worth it, uh, because we bring that much attention to the game of college football. And we're never scrubs. So you telling me that we shouldn't be one of the seven at-large bids because we end up going, you know, with a, at worst a two-loss season? Absolutely we should. You put any other two-loss team up in there, and I promise you, you know, we've got just as good a chance of beating them as anybody. So um, our fans travel worldwide. Uh, we are an attraction, and we are good for the game of college football. Um, so – what I believe that being said is this new system should allow both things to happen. And that is have, you know, all the eyeballs and all the branding and all the bells and whistles that you can get out of a college football playoff because you have such a juggernaut like Notre Dame more than likely always in that, in that picture, but you also have merit-based competition tournament style, you know, knock down drag out, battles and yeah. i think that's uh i think that uh is a great recipe for you know the evolution of of college football hey we don't have to worry about splitting hairs about who's number one we did that yeah. i did that back in 93 for everybody you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> you know my thing with marcus is you kind of touched on it too like just kind of stepping back from like being it like uh, you know my analysis kind of mind and breaking down plays and the games and that sort of thing and getting down the minutia of like his philosophy in terms of, uh, you know, X's and O's is you kind of touched on it with Holtz. Like it seems like Marcus Freeman, he talks about Notre Dame the way that Lou used to. And I don't think that anyone really talked about it like that. Like Davey didn't really have, like he just didn't have that same kind of appreciation in my opinion. Um, I don't think Tide or I don't think Ty did. Weiss kind of did, but he was so like X and O like kind of guy. Like he never really leaned into that. Uh, Brian Kelly definitely didn't lean into that, like the specialness of Notre Dame. And Marcus really does. And uh, uh, I don't know if that's necessary. Go, please. You, you well, the only thing I was going to add to that, I, the only thing I can say I take responsible for, and again, it wasn't in front of the headlines and it wasn't in front of the camera. Um, I was responsible for getting Coach uh, Freeman and Coach Holst to meet for the first time. Uh, Coach Marcus flew down to Orlando. I met him down there, and uh, we met at Coach Holtz's house and uh, visited the whole day. Coach Holtz gave him his his Bible of, uh, yeah. you know, things to have to think about your first days on the job. Um, they went back, and they Xerox copied it and sent him the original one back. Um, and we just spent the day together, went and had dinner together. Um, and um, number one, it was an amazing, for me, just an amazing experience. I was really honored. Um, to be to be part of it, to be part of that exchange, um, and 
to see day, you know, years later, how it's all manifesting in the way that you're seeing it. Because that's what I believed in the first place. I really thought, hey, man, <laughs> let's just go get you some access and advocacy. We're back to that again. Right. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, I think it was just an awesome way of bridging that gap between the two generations. Um, because of that, he's got an amazing support system of advocates throughout all the of, of the Holtz era guys that are coming back. And I know you've heard that we've been coming back in record uh, numbers. We got two all uh, pro Hall of Fame teammates of mine whose sons are going there next year and Brian Young and, and Jerome Bettis. Like, that's what it's all about. Um, I don't see that phenomena happening with any other coaches prior to Marcus Freeman. Mm. Yeah. Like Bobby Taylor's son did not, uh, did not end up at Notre Dame. He went to Texas a &M. So that's something that fans were talking about a ton. Um, well, I, I think, I think everyone is just like excited that you are kind of more public facing now, right. And a little bit more, right. Obviously you're still going to be kind of up on the top row, uh, as you like to say it with, with your son's games. Um, but you're a great example of the what Notre Dame can do, right? Record record breaking player, uh, Super Bowl winner in the NFL, uh, doing very well in business, doing every, uh, very well within the university, right? Like honoring the university and what they were able to do for you, and that's kind of the Notre Dame message. And so I'm glad that that's um, being brought out a little bit more, uh, Derek. Thank you so much for your time. I I love this. I, I enjoyed this very much. I told you before we started recording. Uh, I learned to play the game from from watching you play, and uh, I, you were my first jersey I ever had, and I think that's the case for a lot of people, that number one. So uh, thank you again for coming on. Uh, good luck with your, your son, with Hudson and everything, and uh, and I hope we see we see more of you in South Bend uh, very soon. Thank you much, Greg. The honor's mine. Um, you're doing an amazing job. Uh, your passion for what you do um, is evident, and um... – yeah, I just appreciate all the words. Uh, thank you for taking me down memory lane. All right, absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. Go Irish.